Hello and welcome to the show and an episode where we offer some tough love to product managers around the world in an attempt to help them do product management just a little bit better. Speaking of doing product management better, this episode is sponsored by One Night Consulting. And yes, 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 that's me, but listen up. I started One Night Consulting because I've seen variations of the same problems plaguing product companies and I've seen them again and again. So if you're looking to work out how you can set up your company or your team for success, hire product managers or product leaders or coach the ones you have, you can go to onenightconsulting.com to book a call with me and see if I can help you out. That's onenightconsulting.com. You can check the show notes for more details. Anyway, Patrick Lencioni once wrote that teamwork remains the ultimate competitive advantage and sought to wrap a framework around it to help teams identify their failings, address them and thrive. Tonight's guest is trying to do exactly that for product management teams, so if you want to find out what the five dysfunctions of product management teams are, stick with us on One Night in Product. So my guest tonight is Saeed Khan. Saeed's a product consultant, coach, speaker and founder who says he once won the Great Canadian Egg Race at age 12. Saeed started out working out in a photocopy shop but left after a week because he kept getting paper cuts but he was undeterred from working in dangerous professions and threw himself headlong into product management and product leadership. Saeed's a regular commentator on LinkedIn, Twitter and now Mastodon. You'll often see him taking swipes at blanket statements and context-free thinking. Original listeners may recognise Saeed as one of my earliest guests, back when I was still trying to work out this podcasting thing, but he's now back to check out my good microphone and talk all about the five dysfunctions of product teams. Hi Saeed, how are you tonight? I'm great, thanks. How are you, Jason? I am wonderful and it's good to have you back. But it's been a while, as we said, so just for the benefit of any of my now much bigger number of listeners than back in the first episode, may not have caught you that time around, maybe not have listened back, or hopefully they will after this. But you're the founder of Transformation Labs. So without going too far into it, in general, what are you working on these days? So a few things. Uh, So I'm still doing the consulting work. I'm working with technology companies. And I guess my mission hasn't really changed, so to speak. I, I want to help them build better products and better product teams. And really what that means is helping them understand how to do product better, right? How to, how to get the skills and the, and the processes and things in place and, And, you know, in the context of today's talk, how to not have the five dysfunctions that we'll talk about. And and the end result is product success and business success, right? That's that's what every company wants. Yeah. And I think there's ways to achieve that. And I try and help them to get to to those outcomes better. But what sort of companies are you working for these days? Are there any specific types of challenges that you're fixing at the moment? Or is it just generically across the board, anything in that area that you can help people with? So the types of companies vary. I mean, startups and scale-ups primarily that I work with. And then, you know, the kind of work I do, I mean, a lot of it is very hands-on consulting work. It'll include workshops, mentoring, coaching, and then organizational impact and design to help them. You know, it, it's it's funny. You People want to do the right things, but if they don't have the right team in place with the right skills and so on, they're not going to succeed. So you know, it's not just what they do, but who does it and how they do it and how they're organized. And I, I try and really help them understand those things because they all interrelate. So, you know, basic skills like discovery, uh, road mapping and, you know, launch and things like that. And then other sort of higher level skills in terms of cross-functional management and things like that. You also run the product leaders group in Toronto, which I accidentally snuck onto at some point remotely. But Last time we spoke about that, you were obviously still remote. We were in the one of the lockdowns, so the group had obviously changed a little bit. But have you gone back to doing in-person events and building the leadership community in Toronto? No, we're not in, uh, doing in-person events yet, so everything is still remote. Uh, we just relaunched the the meetings last month, and we have one of your former guests coming on this week, uh, Jax. Oh, there you go. So talking about. Uh, mental health and wellness and product. So I'm looking forward to that. And and yeah, we, we, we will at some point get back to in person. But you know, what's interesting is making it remote has actually made it more accessible. Yeah. We used to be downtown Toronto for the meetups and, you know, Toronto is not centralized in terms of the tech community and people on the outskirts. I, I heard many times I'd love to make it in, but I just, you know, I'm not going to drive downtown at the end of the day and then drive all the way back out to the suburbs. So I, I think what will 
probably end up is is a mix of in person and uh, and then online events. There you go, two point oh, just like this podcast interview. <laughs> but you were one of my first podcast guests, and we spoke give or take two years ago. Check the transcript. We're talking a lot about the challenges of product management, all the classic stuff that we talk about a lot these days around product not having a seat at the table, ambiguous roles, and some of that might touch on some of the dysfunctions that we're going to talk about. But you know, time has moved on in those two years. So I do have to ask, I mean, I'm assuming it's not all fixed now, but has it gotten better from the last time that we spoke about it specifically? Or has it gotten worse? Or is it just kind of about the same? Yeah, well, I, you know, it's really hard for me to speak about an entire industry. But but you're going to try anyway, though, right? But I'm going to try anyway, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like I like doing the hard things. Exactly. I don't think it's changed much. I'll, I'll be honest. I, I think you know, we were in a, and we still are in a pandemic, but we were in a very challenging time last time we spoke. Uh, it was early in the pandemic and there was lots of upheaval going on. And that disruption, I think itself was something people were trying to adjust to. You know, how do we suddenly go from coming to the office to not coming to the office at all? How do we connect with people, connect with customers, do all those things we're doing in one mode? and do it in a completely different mode. And I think most people have adjusted to that. People are going back to in-person uh, work and in-person meetings. But I think underlying everything, things have changed, right? Like teams are more distributed, right? People are more, you know, they've moved. I know people who moved to other cities and work remote 100% of the time. Yep. So I think there's still this period of adjustment going on. And then all of that upheaval didn't do much to solve the core underlying problems that were there anyway. So maybe after that very quick analysis, maybe things are worse, <laughs> but they certainly aren't. Be- <laughs> they, cer- they certainly aren't better in the sense that people understand the fundamental issues better. People are addressing them in more sort of concrete ways. I, I think there's a lot of dynamics and pressures on product that, I mean, they've been around for a while, but th- they haven't changed in two years, quite honestly. But a lot of people and a lot of people that weren't doing it then, they're talking about it a lot on all the different social networks at the moment. And obviously, you call some of these people out from time to time in your own inimitable way where you, for example, see something that someone wrote that maybe doesn't apply in all situations or is a bit kind of generic or doesn't take all things into consideration or isn't well argued. So do you feel, though, that there's a much more concerted effort, no matter how well it may be being executed, but like a much more concerted effort to at least try to change it now? Or do you think that these people are just shouting into the void and not really changing it because they're not talking maybe to the right people about changing it? No, I, I think I think there's there's a lot of really good, strong voices out there. And 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 I think everyone who's trying to make things better is contributing to forward movement. But I think there are also a lot of and I, I don't know, I I wouldn't say it's malicious anyway, but I think there's a lot of opposing opinions. And they're pulling things in other directions. So there isn't really, I would say, a cohesive voice moving product forward in a cohesive way in the sense that here's a direction to head into and here's here's how we can all kind of get to better places. I think here's the thing, right? I think every market has these kind of challenges. You know, in sales, there's all these different sales methodologies and Marketing has its own sort of different viewpoints. But I think the challenge with product has been that traditionally people don't understand it well. It hasn't been implemented well. And it's different in the sense that it's inherently cross-functional and people don't understand what that really means or how to think about it. So all all these problems still exist. I think some companies are figuring it out and and that's great for them. But there's a lot of new companies coming in wanting to be product-oriented. I was talking to a guy last week from a small bank and they want to move from project to product and he's trying to get his executives to kind of understand that and you know it's a challenge because the people who are making decisions are running businesses they're not thinking about product management or product they're thinking about how do I how do I you know meet the challenges that we're facing so it's 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 almost like the old IT versus business golf <laughs> but now it's product versus management golf. Yeah, well, let's start to talk a little bit about some of the ways that that manifests itself. But before we talk about the five dysfunctions of product teams, which is the article that you put up back in July on Medium, 
Let's talk about what that draws inspiration from. So obviously, Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni was a great book, business fable that I personally recommend. I think it's a really good book. And I think it's got some really good insight for people about how the dynamics between teams work. And the original dysfunctions that he calls out uh, absence of trust, fear of conflict, lack of commitment, avoidance of accountability and inattention to results. So before we talk about your spin, do you think that your versions are just these things that are just spun out into very much more product management specific versions of themselves, but they're still talking to the same basic problems? Or do you feel that product teams suffer from these original dysfunctions, as well as the new ones that you're talking about? So his five are very horizontal, right? They're not they're not tied to any specific type of organization. You know, I yeah. think, as he said, you know, it could be a church group, even or something, it could be in anyone. And, and so things like absence of trust, absolutely, that's exists in product, right? Fear of conflict. Yeah. You know, I, there's product managers who don't want to kind of rock the boat. They don't want to say no. Yeah. Like, that's right. They don't want to say no. Lack of commitment, absolutely. Avoidance of accountability and international. So all those things are there in, in companies. But what I've seen is there are more specific ones that are, and they, again, there may be a bit of overlap, but they're, they're really specific to product organizations. And, and I think getting specific, like one thing, you know, you can talk about absence of trust and how you, you solve that, but you can have a group that trusts each other, but if they're underskilled, <laughs> you're not going to get too far. <laughs> so, so I think the way I've tried to approach is that given the work they do, and, you know, I, I get to see inside a lot of companies, the problems tend to be, pretty similar within product teams. And, you know, every company thinks that they're unique and they are, obviously their situation is unique, but there's patterns that exist. And I see these patterns a lot. So that's where sort of the inspiration of this article came from. I think that uniqueness though is a really interesting point because of course the specifics are very different for every single company in the sense that they all have different products. They all have different people and personalities within the teams, but from what I've seen when I've been out there talking to people, it does seem that there are lots of very common themes. And I guess, obviously, again, that speaks to some of the dysfunctions. But I think the most interesting thing, and this is something that I've seen before, is like you call out a particular behavior or type of thing that happens in a company, and people get really defensive because they think that you're talking about them because they're the only company that has that kind of problem. And then obviously, the obvious rebuttal is, well, every type of company has that problem, or all types of company have a version of that problem. But everyone just thinks they're their own sort of special little flower and not just almost like a representation of just something that happens across the entire industry. Well, so here's the thing, right? When you work inside a company, you work inside a company, you don't see what's going on inside other companies. Yeah. For me, as a consultant, I'm working with you know several companies a year, right? Many companies a year. So I see this across companies. And one of the things I often tell my clients is, especially we're talking about some kind of very troubling problem they have is, and, and, and I'm not just saying this to sort of make them feel better. It's, it's true. It's like, hey, <laughs> you're not alone in this, right? Like, don't think you're unique. I've seen this problem several times. Yeah. How it manifested itself might have been slightly different or, you know, the exact situation wasn't exactly the same, but, but the general pattern was the same, right? I mean, what company doesn't have problems at the executive level, right? What company doesn't have <laughs> lack of alignment problems, right? What company doesn't have rogue salespeople or rogue, you know, engineers or something, right? Like these are just this is this is how companies are. But then the impacts of that really, really vary. No, absolutely. But let's talk about those five dysfunctions of a product team then. But before we do that, I do have to ask, why are we picking on product teams? I mean, shouldn't we be all positive and hopeful and idealistic like product teams have it hard enough without us telling them that they're doing stuff wrong right yeah well you know part of my job description is to air all our dirty laundry so <laughs> you know like like if you if you can't if you can't talk about a problem how are you going to solve it right yep so and and i think here's the thing too right quite honestly is is there is so much unexploited potential here and when exploited is not in a negative sense like there's so much potential to do better, to do better for the people and to do better for the companies, right? And so why not? Like if you had a sales team that was underperforming, 
you wouldn't go, hey, let's not talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, they get fired and they get different salespeople in there, right? Yeah, but you know, you'd, you'd, you'd look to solve the problem, right? And you know, yeah. the thing about sales is it's easier to measure if they're performing well. Same with marketing on a certain level. Product is harder to measure their, their, their direct contribution and their direct impact, but the goal is still the same. Let's, let's understand what's wrong and why it might be wrong, and then let's solve it. And, and let's solve it in a way that really impacts the company. But you have to really get honest about it. Like you can't gloss over it and just kind of, you know, oh, put a layer of icing and let's, let's all make it look nice. Like you really, you really want to get to the core problem. And, you know, I, I, I remember did a consulting project once and I did this organizational analysis and I interviewed about 30 or 35 people. You know, it's sort of like a 360 review of the product org, but the product org in touches all these other groups. So it's, it's, it, it, it's almost, and it's not really, but it's almost like a review of the, of the company. Long story short, one of the big problems that lots of people cited was management and in particular the CIO. And, and the CIO was the guy who had hired me to actually do this work. <laughs> and, and so, and I, I told them up front, I said, look, I'm going to tell you the truth. Whether you want to accept it or not, that's up to you. Yeah. And so, I mean, they, they had lots of issues and that's fine. But I did highlight in the report that, you know, there was a lot of fingers pointing up at management and at the CIO. And, and what amazed me was the CIO, when we presented all the results back, he had pulled out every single quote from the report that referenced him. And he put it up on a slide and he said, I'm going to own this. I'm going to fix this. This is what you're saying about me. And I am part of the problem and I'm going to solve that. And I was, I was so impressed by that because here was yep. someone who really wanted to get at the heart of things. And, and I think that's the kind of leadership you need, right? You need leaders who are going to say, yeah, I'm going to own up to my part. I'm going to help solve the problem and I'm going to eliminate myself from being part of the problem. And so that to me was honesty. And that honesty is what you need to solve these problems. Yeah, I 100% agree. I think the one dark side of some of this honesty, though, is in certain organizations, and I guess certain people that have worked in certain organizations, there's almost this implicit blame. Like one of the things that I push back on is the concept of like good product manager, bad product manager, like the old article. Like, yeah. obviously, it is possible for product managers and product teams to work well or poorly, but I don't necessarily think it should be seen as like a character flaw of the person. Like, let's not commit fundamental attribution error. Let's go and fix the actual behaviors rather than try and judge the motivations or that they're not good enough or not. So I 100% agree, as long as the companies and the teams are set up to actually accept that, take that on the nose like that CIO did, and actually yeah, move on in a really productive way. Absolutely. So I'll say two things on that. So first of all, whenever I, I do this work, I make that explicitly clear that none of this is, is a finger pointing or indictment of any individual, right? In the CIO's case, he was a, a, an explicitly identified individual. Yeah. But in general, I don't, you know, if, if people point fingers, I remove all that. I, I don't include specific individuals, individual contributors or things like that, right? But in his case, it, there was no way around it. Like you couldn't go <laughs> generic executive as a problem. <laughs> and, and on the flip side, though, I think that this kind of work really requires that level of detail. Like you, you can't solve specific problems with generic solutions, right? So yeah. if there's an organizational issue, here's an example. So in that same company, product management got hammered by people. There were a lot of things. And, and the head of product, I mean, he was, he was very defensive. Like he said, look, he was in fact, not happy that they were doing this assessment because, you know, there was seven product managers and, you know, 40 other people, right? Guess where the bulk of the commentary is going to go? Yeah. And, and I said, look, I, I, I understand your, your issue, but I can also understand if it's valid or not. Like, where is the valid criticism coming from? And we'll talk about that. Now, what was interesting was a lot of it went against him, but we spent a year working with them. I spent a year working with them to address a lot of issues. And then we did a follow-up assessment a year later. And guess what? Literally not a single complaint about product management. And the problem wasn't that product management all of a sudden had gotten their act together. Yeah, they had done some things, but the company itself was functioning way better 
And so the issues that were looking like they were coming from product management had been addressed. And I pointed that out as well. I said, like, literally not a single complaint from essentially all the same people. So I think that's the thing that people have to understand, right? It's it's about the system, not about the individual or the, the specific team. No, absolutely. Big fan of thinking about the system as well. But let's start talking about some of those five specific product dysfunctions. Yes. So the first dysfunction is poor job definitions. Yeah. Which speaks to some of what we've talked about before, about the sort of the ambiguity of the role, how poorly understood product management is. But are you just talking about rubbish, ambiguous job specs that I've complained about before, like, you know, ones that look like they've been stuck together from two other job specs or just ask for everything? Or I think one example you showed of like just a bullet point for just any other task that people wanted, like, <laughs> is it that type of thing that you're talking about? Or is there something more fundamental when you're talking about poor job definitions? So I, I use the phrase poor job definition specifically versus job description. Yeah. So y- yes, I think poor job descriptions are a symptom of the problem, right? So if you're going to put out a job that's all generic or unicorn or whatever, you probably don't understand what the real need is. And what, I, what I've found with a number of companies is that being the case. There's this one company I was working with, and they had product managers. They had a director of product management. They had product owners, et cetera. And I said, can you show me the, the job description for product manager? And they said, oh, well, um, we don't have one. Like, okay, what are the responsibilities? Like, where you must, you have an HR department. <laughs> you know, where, have you, where have you laid that out? And they, all <laughs> they had was the job description that they'd put up on, you know, Indeed or wherever they'd put it up. And I said, okay, well, where did you get this from? And they said, oh, we copied it from another company. <laughs> and so you had people in roles who were doing work, but there wasn't clarity of exactly what work they should be doing. And so they yeah. end up being very engineering centric. Sure, working with a product owner, working with UX, et cetera. But it really wasn't clear. And then what, what are their objectives, right? What are they really trying to achieve? So I think that whole situation is a big problem. Essentially, you've got people working in jobs without clarity, and then you expect some great results from it. Like, imagine the same thing with sales. Well, you're going you're gonna to get on the phone, and you're going to go visit people, and you're going to ask them for money. And like, what? No, <laughs> you're going to be pretty precise with a salesperson. You're probably going to be precise with, you know, other roles. Why isn't that the case here? So I think it's a symptom, but it's a it's a starting point. Like when you look into a lot of companies, what do product managers do? And what I what I I tell people is that the reason you've got this unicorn dis- description is because you haven't really thought through what you want them to do, right? Like, well, we don't yeah. know what we want them to do, so we 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 put everything, you know. So it's just like I don't know how to how to say it, but to me, it's nonsensical that you would hire someone with that amount of ambiguity about the job they're doing, especially given how important that job is. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, a big part of that is that people don't really have a strong understanding of what product managers should really be doing. But there's also this narrative, which I've seen from some parties, which is like, product managers are just glue. They're just there to fill in the gaps, take messages between the development team and the sales team sit in a bunch of different calls maybe and help do the QA help with UAT it's fair to say that some people are very much in favor of this being helpful just doing whatever needs to be done type approach and I guess there's a lot to be said for being helpful but from your perspective why aren't product managers glue or why is it not good for them to be glue well we could get into a discussion of what is glue if you really want to think about it right (laughs) like you know, when you glue two things together, what what are you really doing, right? Like, are you making something better or are you fixing a problem? Like, what is it? Are you hiring people just to be problem fixers? Are you hiring people just to connect one group with another? Like, think about what that means, right? I, I've heard people use phrases like gap filler, glue, connective tissue. And I think what people are trying to express, at least I hope, is the cross-functional nature of the role. And in that sense, you can think of it as something that helps bind 
groups together and align them and so on. And I think that's absolutely a part of the responsibility of product yeah. management. But that's not the primary focus in the sense that you do it without a context. Well, you're just glue. You're going to fill the gap over here and, you know, like do what's needed. Like it's, you can hire people who whose job that is, but that's not product management, right? So I, I think really it, it is a lack of understanding of product management. You know, we talked about this last time. Uh, we talked about the actual word product management and what is the management, right? Like maybe people should ask themselves that question. I'm hiring a manager. I'm hiring a manager of product. What is the management I want from them? Yeah. And really think about that. Is it just delivery management? Is that what you're hiring them for? Is it business management? Is it organizational management? Like there's lots of different types of management that you could be doing. And good product managers do multiple types of management. But I think people need to think about that explicitly and really understand that. Because I don't know what glue is in terms of management, <laughs> but it's not, it doesn't sound like a really, you know, meaningful or valuable type of management. What well, is a kind of almost like odd job type mentality there, like a someone that's just going to come in and fix a, a few little bits and then just go off to the next thing and always be firefighting and just kind of almost making up for other people's inability to talk to each other as well which again obviously there is some of that in product management you know you do have to talk to a bunch of people bring people together but like at the same time i think it's fair to say that in most organizations people could just do with talking between the teams a little bit more as well rather than relying on someone else to carry the messages around absolutely absolutely i think there's far less expensive and far more scalable ways of solving the communication problem <laughs> than to hire an intermediary yeah, 100%. Okay, so the next dysfunction you talk about, and you mentioned it earlier as well, underskilled product managers. Now, we could probably assume that's in part because their jobs are ambiguous, as per what we just said, like it's difficult to be skilled in something if there's not actually a something to be skilled in, in certain companies. But what are some of the obvious signs of an underskilled product manager day to day? Okay, so in terms of signs, and this is part of, you know, when I, when I, I do my work, I, I try and spend a lot of time listening. In, in observing and in trying to see what's really going on. You know, it's, it's hard, you know, it's sort of like the Heisenberg principle. Like when you measure something, you, you impact what you're measuring, right? That's like yeah. at, the, at the quantum level. But so, you know, having the observer there that does impact behavior. But when I hear people talking in very generic terms, they're not specific in what they're saying. They're not clear in what they're doing. Like, you know, if they exist at the 100,000 foot level, those are all signs to me of, of people who are out of context, who don't have the skills to get into whatever problem they're in. So, you know, when I talk about underskilled product managers, what I really mean is, yes, there's an impact from the poor job definition of who you've hired. But part of it is that, first of all, none of us were trained in school. There's no undergraduate program for product management or anything like that. Not yet. Not yet. Yeah. There's some master's programs. But it's also a job that you learn from doing because it is so diverse, right? Like if you just think about uh, discovery work, like discovery work is a lot of qualitative research. Most of us weren't taught how to do qualitative research analysis in the school. Yeah. And so you can go through the motions of interviewing people and so on. But if you don't understand the details of the kinds of questions, et cetera, how to do the analysis, how to get insights, how to draw conclusions, you're not going to be successful, right? The same thing with road mapping. Like the biggest part of road mapping is the part that's ignored most, in my opinion, which is the cross functional aspect of it, right? Road mapping as a process is what you really want to focus on, not publishing a road map, right? And that road mapping process is about strategy, about alignment and about really understanding the nature of the business you're in and how you're going to succeed. And yet, you know, the focus is on what's on the roadmap. <laughs> what are we going to deliver when, which, which is a whole other issue. Yep. And, and so these skills are not like hard skills that you can just say, oh, here, take a seminar or take a one-day workshop or, you know, listen to this podcast or whatever, you know. Like they are skills that come through doing and from repeatedly doing, and then being coached. So 
those are the things that people don't understand. I've sat in enough roadmap presentations and, and seen the frowns on executive faces when the roadmap is presented. And, and really, it's because <laughs> what's being presented doesn't align with what they're expecting or what they need to see. And that is coming from other issues. So like these are, this is one comment when I say under skill. It's not that you don't have smart people, like they, they know SQL, they can do things in Excel in their sleep and they can, you know, use whatever tools are out there. But it's these other more sort of intangible skills and bringing all of that together. And I've seen people with five years, seven years product management experience who really struggle in a new context. As an example, let's say you're working on a brand new product. So you, you, you've been a product manager of existing products, but now you've got to define a new product. That's a whole different set of skills. Yep. And how you manage that is very different. So again, these are things that are learned over time and you learn by doing and you learn through kind of good mentorship, et cetera. But is it then just a case of that school of hard knocks, learn by doing type approach that you just mentioned? Obviously, you touched on coaching and mentorship as well. But in some of these companies, it's going to be quite hard to get good coaches or mentors from within the company to help them out because maybe the people that are even leading the teams are somewhat underskilled themselves. So is it just a case of these people trying to do their best to persuade management to get them external training, external coaching? Or are there other things that these PMs can do to kind of self-start their own upskilling journey? Well, they should listen to your podcast. <laughs> and that, that should be like level one. So no, I think I think absolutely they should be looking for guidance. And if it's not available internally, then they should look for it externally. There's enough people now who are doing coaching and mentoring and can provide that assistance. And you know, the the ROI of that is is enormous in, in the sense yeah. that, like quite honestly, what's the cost of screwing up a release? Like if you really add it up, right? Yeah. It's probably if you did it even in a small company, it's probably in the millions of dollars if you add up all the lost potential, right? Like it's the rework and then the lost potential, the market momentum, all that stuff. So why not invest in your people if you truly believe that your people are, are valuable and invest a few thousand dollars or whatever the, the cost is and get them some mentorship and some coaching and help them along. And, and it's not going to solve the problem. You know, if it was the magic bullet, great, but it's going <laughs> to, it's going to really help you avoid any big, you know, really big errors. And it also says something about the mindset of the management who understand that yeah, we don't have all the answers internally. We can get help externally. And our goal is to move the people and the company forward in a, in a positive way, right? So I, I, think, I think that coaching in anything, I mean, look, even coaches have coaches. And I'm talking about product <laughs> management people. But, you know, seriously, if you look in the business world, yep. this is not something new. And so I just think it's one of the probably easiest and lowest risk ways to you know bring your people forward yeah super high leverage but the next dysfunction then is all about poor processes or processes i'm sure you'd call them now for many people in the product and agile community and i can think of a few specific names in particular the very word process or process is a dirty word and obviously many companies try and cover up bad product practices poor culture bad communication all of that stuff with layers and layers of checklists and procedures and processes so I understand where you're going with this conceptually, like the idea that you need to be able to do something, you need some kind of repeatability, but how much process should we really be gunning for in a well-functioning product company? As much as makes sense. So oh, there you go. It depends. So, well, so here's the thing, right? This word process, and we say process, not process. Anyway, oh, there you go. Uh, <laughs> it's a loaded term and people immediately jump to the heavyweight, regimented, you know, overly structured mindset. But, you know, there, there's a quote in the article, but it, I think it's absolutely true. It's by Deming. Actually, there's two quotes, and I'll read them out. One is, if you can't describe what you're doing as a process, you don't know what you're doing. And then the <laughs> other one is, a bad system will beat a good person every time. Yep. And so the, the thing is that 
when we think about it, like sales, and I'll I'll go back to these things, sales methodology. Oh, stop so beating this? up sales, for goodness sake. I'm actually not beating up sales. I'm actually talking about <laughs> sales in a way. I'll, I'll say this. If sales departments were run the way product organizations are run in most companies, those companies would go bankrupt in short order. <laughs> There's a lot more process and a lot more diligence in sales organizations than there is in many product organizations. And and I, I'm just being yeah. honest about that. Like, like you, you sit in on a sales funnel call, right? And I've sat in on them. And, you know, people are held accountable. Hey, you know, Saeed, what's going on with your funnel? Okay, what are the opportunities? What's going on here? What about this? What, you know, and every week I worked in a company where every week the sales VP would publish the funnel and what the projections were for that quarter. And we would know, like, it didn't go out to the whole company, but product mansion was one of the people who got it. And you know what? Like, that was more than the engineering team was doing. That was more than the product management team was doing. So what I'm saying is these kinds of things, like whether you call what sales was doing a process or not, that's up to you. But that kind of diligence and rigor is what's needed for repeatable success. And that's what sales is after, repeatable success. It's not we hit our number this quarter and everything goes to hell next quarter, right? <laughs> you want that same mindset in product. When we do discovery, we do it in a repeatable way and we get good outputs. And we know that things might be going wrong and we can address them, right? If you don't know what you're doing, then you don't know when things are going wrong. If you're just going out, hey, let's go interview people. Like I, I worked with a company once and, and they really were enthusiastic about discovery. And they went out and did all these interviews. And I, I was really trying to get them to like do some analysis along the way. Like after every call, have a little huddle. What did we learn? You know, what should we change, et cetera? You know, after you do about half, you should kind of really go in and dig into the data and understand it and see what else is going on, what conclusions can you draw. And they did none of it. And so <laughs> so at, at the end, like they did, they did all their analysis, but of course they'd forgotten some of the stuff from the early interviews and some of the notes weren't great. And then some of the questions they were asking towards the end were probably not as good as they could have been. Yeah. And their results weren't as good as they could have been, right? And there was a lot of ambiguity in certain parts. And, you know, they did get some insights, but boy, for that effort, the results weren't great. And if you make a parallel to sales, they would have missed their number, Yeah. even though they did all of that work. So the point is, that rigor, that diligence, that process, here's ways to do things. Here's better ways to do things, follows better ways. And you're not dependent on heroes, you know, the individuals who will get it done for you. We talked about that last time as well. Oh, yes, we did. Perseus. Yes, Perseus. And you're building a team, right? And that's really what you want. You want people who will build a team. So going back to sports analogies, you know, the plays are the process, right? The plays, the football plays or the the hockey plays or whatever, that's part of the process. What are your plays in product management, right? Do you have plays for discovery? Do you have plays for roadmap? Do you have plays for, you know, launch? Do you have plays for other things? Like all that stuff should be clear to people. And if it's not, then it's all ad hoc. And yeah. what can you expect from ad hoc work? You'll get ad hoc results. No, that sounds fair enough. I'm convinced and we'll start to implement safe as soon as I get off this call. But next up, we have a dysfunction that will no doubt resonate with many, many listeners, and that's the dysfunction of unclear objectives. Now, again, that's not an uncommon refrain from lots of people, but are you talking about purely a product team objective perspective, or are you talking about literally the entire company from leadership down, or are you talking about both? Well, okay, in an ideal world, everything is clear to everybody. But when we think of product, what are the objectives of product organizations or product teams or product management teams, right? So often those objectives are delivery. Yep. We got X, Y, and Z out, out to market. And that's fine as an objective. It's not great as a product management objective because that product management is not strictly a delivery team and that's not the objective of product management, right? The objective of product management is product success. Success depends on the context, right? It depends on the maturity of the product, the market, et cetera. But there should be clear success metrics that people are working towards and they can measure against, right? Yeah. Revenue is a success metric, but A, 
it's a very lagging metric and B, yep. it's so far out of the direct influence of product management that it's very hard to correlate the work you're doing with that. So I think that absolutely product managers should understand revenue objectives and part of their work should contribute to it because that's that's sort of the the now part of their work. But really the biggest thing that product management can do as an organization and company is set up the company for success next year or the year after, right? Yeah. For future repeatable success. So in the same way that you want a sales team that you don't have to worry every quarter is going to deliver your numbers, you want to have a product management team that you don't have to worry is going to deliver what they need to deliver quarter after quarter, year after year. We, we know that we're building generally the right things, right? There's risk, obviously, but we're, we're, we know that we're targeting the right people. We're expanding into the right markets. We're doing the things that are driving the overall product success that drives business success. And it's a hard thing often for companies to understand that those business goals need to be decomposed into smaller product goals. I, I once worked with a company and they'd been around for a while and I asked them, I just wanted to see, I said, look, you don't have to show me if it's confidential, but you know, what's the history? That whole bunch of little, little products. And I said, can you show me just even the, the, the numbers that you've sold of each of these. I, you know, if you don't want to show me revenue, that's fine. And it would have taken them a month to pull all that together because they looked at everything in aggregate. Yeah. It wasn't a question of which specific products were selling well. It was just, hey, we, we met our number for the quarter, for the year, or whatever. And so what, you know, how is a product manager going to have an objective in a company like that where the details aren't even easily accessible, right? Is my product doing well? Well, I don't, I, who knows, right? They were delivering. <laughs> yeah. So this idea of objectives, I think, has to be broken out to be in business objectives, in product objectives, and they should be clear and they should be measurable. And then you should be able to tie, not, you can't do it 100%, but you should be able to tie major initiatives to contribution to those goals. And essentially, what you want to be able to be confident about is that you're directionally correct, right? So that you're doing the things that are contributing to that success. In some cases, you may know exactly, hey, we did X and we got Y, then that's great. But in a lot of cases, the actual impact comes quite a bit downstream. But you can, you can kind of connect some dots and say, yeah, we can see how we influenced what happened. But having clear objectives and honing them over time I think is a discipline that product organizations need to really work on. No, absolutely. Well, there's one more thing that they need to work on as well, which is the final dysfunction, which is weak product leadership. Feeling very attacked at this point. But obviously, there are a few ways that product leadership can be weak. But on the other hand, personally, I'm a massive advocate for product managers, good product managers who want to get into leadership to have a chance to get into product leadership and get coached in and become effective leaders themselves. But what's worse in your mind? Is it the Peter Principle PMs that have been promoted up past their capability, gone from being a strong IC to a floundering leader? Or is it the kind of top-down, parachuted-in business strategy folks that kind of get brought in because they don't think that the product team's got enough adults in it to actually lead it? So the latter, 99.9999% of the time. I would say that the first one can be coached and helped to succeed. If we can find them a coach. If you can find them a coach, yeah. yeah well, if, if, you're not, if you're not willing to find them a coach, then there's a bigger problem to solve. <laughs> so here's the thing, right? And, and that, we talked about this a bit last time as well, but what does it mean to be a product leader? What, it's not just a job title, right? You can't just say, oh... George, hey, you know, here's here's the job title, go do the job. It really is a discipline and an understanding and a real appreciation for the details of the work to be done. And yeah. if you don't know what those are, if you haven't done that work and you haven't faced those challenges yourself, then how are you going to lead a team and coach them to do the things they need to do? You don't have the pattern recognition. 
that you need to have. And again, you know, would you hire a sales guy to have a sales team who's never done sales or a marketing person who's never done marketing to lead a marketing team? Yeah. I want to see one example, like just one example of a company that hired a CFO who had never worked in finance in any shape or form. <laughs> Show me one, right? Because you'd never do it. It's like the stupidest thing you could do. And yet, well, you know, maybe Musk is doing it at Twitter. I don't know. But, <laughs> but you have to understand that the discipline of the product, which touches all the other parts of the company, requires a skill set that can work across the company, that appreciates marketing for what they do, sales for what they do, services for what they do, et cetera, and then bring that to the table. So without question, I would take someone who's come up through the ranks and is a weak, weaker leader and work with them to help them become a better leader than to parachute someone in who doesn't understand the domain at all. I think, though, the, this idea of weak product leadership is probably, and I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, I put it last, but I wanted to put it first. Yeah. Because it's really the biggest problem that I see. And, and when I see weak product leadership, it's not an attack on the people themselves. I mean, I've seen many people very earnestly trying to do the right things. I once worked at a company and there was a, a VP of operations who owned product management. Product management was a very small team, but probably a really great VP of operations, but didn't understand the basics of how to work with engineering, how to create a roadmap, how to do the things that need to be done. And so you're not going to be successful. You're not going to be successful as a leader. And you're not going to be successful as an organization. And I think that's something companies need to realize that there's a, a cost and a price they're paying by doing this kind of thing. And so if you were to fix one thing, and I think this is a question you're probably going to ask me, this is where I would start. Start with a really good leader, someone who's experienced, who can come in. Now, that doesn't guarantee success. It's not the magic bullet here, but it is the starting point because then if you go back up through all the other issues, right, processes, right, objectives, hiring, organizing your teams, all that stuff, someone who can bring that context together and put these things in place are going to help solve your other problems. But there are play companies where you have product leaders and maybe they're not weak, maybe they're not super strong, but they're competent. But there's organizational issues that cause these other problems, right? We don't always get the perfect candidate to hire. We don't always have the liberty of doing the processes the way we want, you know, time pressures or things like that. So these are all things that have to be, they're all interconnected, but definitely without a strong leader. It's like any, you know, again, going back to sports analogies, without a strong captain or a strong coach on the team you're not going to get the results you want. Well, though, an interesting point there is, and I agree, obviously, with, with all of that, but I've been thinking about this a little bit myself recently, this idea that there are certain companies out there that need strong product leadership because they're in a bit of a bind. They've maybe not got the best processes or people or objectives, all of the stuff that you've talked about. And they need probably substantial surgery to get them up to what we might consider a better functioning standard, like make the engine run a little bit more efficiently or start delivering better outcomes, all of the stuff that maybe a really good product leader could come in and do. But is that the sort of place that a really good product leader actually wants to go? Or do they want to go somewhere that's already got a kind of baseline of functionality that they can then improve? And I mean, I guess the question is like, how many of the really best product leaders actually want to go and be like fundamental transformers versus almost optimizers? I, I don't know. I, I can't speak for all of them. But you can try. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I think it really depends on the nature of the person and what really invigorates them. I love this work. I'll be honest with you. I, I love problem solving. I think this notion of building great product organizations is an unmet challenge right now. I think there's a lot of potential for it. And so, you know, if you're an optimizer, great, be an optimizer. There's nothing wrong with that, right? That's, that's where you find satisfaction. Yeah. I know a lot of product people who have said to me, and not, not in this context, but in a pure work context, they love solving hard problems, you know, product problems, for example, working in difficult markets and really, you know, finding 
ways to succeed. You know, intellectually, it's very satisfying to to do that and and find that success. So, I I would say that it really depends. I, I would look at it personally, and I would look at both the problems in the company and the opportunity for a company. So, if I'm going to go into a company, and and I'm just going to put myself in the role of you know a CPO or a VP of product or something like that, going into one of these companies, and I'm going to dedicate my time to solving these tough organizational problems. And they are tough, right? There's a lot of history and culture and a lot of friction to fight against. I would want to look at it from that perspective and say, okay, what's the upside, right? I'm going to put in this effort and I'm going to, if I can turn this company around, you know, and it's not a me, me, me thing, but, you know, working with the rest of the executives, is there a lot of upside? If you're, if you're going to a company that probably is in a very low growth market, it might not be all that satisfying to do. But if you're going to go into a company that really has a lot of new potential and can grow a lot, I think I think the reward is worth the effort. So I, I don't know. I, I, I found over the years that my personal biases are towards people. The technical problems are there and I, you know I can still wrap my head around them. But I think the people problems are where the real sort of pleasure comes from. And I love seeing people succeed where they weren't succeeding. And so, you know, and and quite honestly, the biggest barrier to success for every company are the people and the cultures in those companies. It's not your competitor outside. The (laughs) biggest barriers are internal. And I think people need to realize that and then understand that, yeah, they can succeed, but they have to overcome those internal challenges. Because guess what? Your competitors are overcoming them as well, right? It's not like your competitors are getting a free ride. No. They have similar challenges. Yeah, everyone always looks good from the outside, right? It's funny, but we always do that. Oh, look at how great they're doing, right? Because we only see one side of them. You know, it's like that whole Spotify model thing. Like, oh, Spotify model squads, let's do that. And then you find out, well, Spotify didn't really do that themselves. That was just <laughs> that was just a blog post somebody put, you know, about one team or something. Yeah. Well, food for thought. But where can people find you after this if they want to find out more about combating these dysfunctions? maybe find out a little bit more about your coaching or maybe even challenge you to another egg race to see if you still got what it takes. We should have talked about the egg race. You know, you mentioned it in the intro. <laughs> That's bonus content. We can put that behind a paywall. Oh, okay. Absolutely. Uh, that, was my, that was my one claim to fame as a kid. <laughs> so uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn slash in slash Saeed W. Khan, I guess. Transformationlabs.io is the site of my company uh, website. And then, you know, as long as Twitter still exists, <laughs> which might be another week with the way things are going, it's Saeed W. Khan on Twitter. And then I'm on Mastodon as well, which I, I will say I only joined a couple of weeks ago. And after the initial, hey, this isn't like Twitter. <laughs> Actually, I, I'm really liking it. Uh, there's a, a growing product community and it's just nice. It's simple. It's and you know you can you can edit posts you can <laughs> you can write 500 characters at a time and the bots and trolls haven't showed up yet so give them time i think mastodon i hope i hope mastodon continues and you know improves and and, and grows cuz i i kind of i kind of like what what's happening over there well fair enough i'll make sure to link all of those different places into the show notes and hopefully you get some people racing in your direction for some excellent advice <laughs> <laughs> well that's, i'm sorry about that to, to the gods of comedy i'm so sorry well that's been a fantastic chat so again thanks a lot for coming back for round two uh maybe there'll be a round three one day in a couple of years time if i'm still doing this thing uh, obviously we'll stay in touch and all of those different places but as for now thanks for taking the time thanks jason thank you as always thanks for listening i hope you found the episode inspiring and insightful if you did, again, I can only encourage you to pop over to onenightinproduct.com, check out some of my other fantastic guests, sign up to the mailing list or subscribe on your favourite podcast app and make sure you share with your friends so you and they can never miss another episode again. I'll be back soon with another inspiring guest, but as for now, thanks and good night.